Hi everyone, how are you doing today? I know that the world is in a little bit of chaos right now, and I've been thinking about you guys a lot. I've been thinking about everyone a lot. The first thing that I'd like to say to you before we start this episode is how are you doing? You. Just you. Are you okay? Have you been eating? Can you find food? Do you have everything that you need? Is the news getting to be a little bit too much for you? People are panicking right now, and I have been wanting to say something to you guys, but putting it on social media just didn't seem right. Um, I am deeply struggling with social media myself and seeing everything there and some of the podcasts that I listen to and how deeply they're covering the subject because as an empath and a light worker and all the other things that I am, I feel what you guys are feeling. I feel the panic and the anger and the frustration and how scared people are. And I also feel how angry they are too. Some of the people who've been around me have been saying things that are so horrible about other people and it just makes me sad. I've gotten to the point where I kind of just want to be a little hermit, which is typically of my nature, which is typically my nature to be a hermit, but it's because I don't want to see it anymore. So I won't say much more about this particular subject. I'm not even going to name it. I don't think that's necessary. I just didn't feel right doing our normal, happy, giddy up and go intro when I know how you're probably doing. So please, if you've never done so before, get something to drink, have a snack, and I hope that you enjoy the next hour of the show. This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to bigheadsmedia.com for more great podcasts. Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming to the show. I have a very special and very amazing guest. Um, her name is Corby Midlight. Corby, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's a pleasure to be here. What I want to ask you, I actually I have a ton of questions I want to ask you, but the first thing is tell everybody a little bit about what it is that you do and what your interests are, and also you've written a book, so talk a little bit about that too. Okay, this is what I call the 30-second elevator speech. Um, <laughs> I've been reading tarot since I was uh, 18. I'm 65. Being a psychic medium and intuitive counselor is my full-time job. Uh, I travel as many as 40 weekends a year, coast to coast and into Canada. But I'm what I call your straight, no chaser reader. I'm very practical. There's no fluffy bunny or glurpy purple with angels. It's here are your opportunities and how to grab them. Here's the tough stuff and how to get through it or around it. Here's your toolbox. Go rock and roll. I believe that um, my clients absolutely have the ability to change their own lives. And yes, you can do what I do. We're all wired like the same house plan. I'm not one of those psychics who thinks her aura don't stink. And yes, <laughs> I'm funny. Um, I've written a couple of books. One of them is called Clean Out Your Life Closet, which is about clarity, adaptability, simplicity, and making friends with stress. And the other one is The Psychic Yellow Brick Road, How to Find the Real Wizards and Avoid the Flying Monkeys, because... These days, so many people want to use a psychic. So many people mm -hmm. are looking but don't know how. So what we tell everybody is, look, good psychic guidance is an art. Don't settle for a forgery. Damn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. So, crap. Where do I want to start now? All right. You mentioned that you have been reading tarot since you were 18. So can you talk to me a little bit about what got you into tarot? Oh, absolutely. When I was nine, I read a book called The Witch Family by Eleanor Estes. And instead of thinking, ooh, that's scary or ha, 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 I thought, and your point is, I knew there was magic in the world and I wanted to go find it. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to 1973 when I was a senior in high school working part-time at Spencer Gifts. 
<laughs> that was the year that Live and Let Die came out, and they had the James Bond 007 tarot deck, and I bought it. I mean, we were all hippies then. You had your elephant bells, and you had your fringe jacket, and you had your cards. Now, five years later, everybody else had moved on to roller skates and disco balls, and I was still reading because the artwork fascinated me. I am a storyteller by nature, and the cards helped me tell stories to people to help them move forward. And I learned I'm just the tube. As long as I kept my own stuff out of it, I could read clearly. And I've never looked back. Well, and the universe is also you. You, I was over here laughing when you gave me your, your 30 second elevator speech because you said something and it is so incredibly true. The universe and when you work with the universe does not allow you any time to have any sort of bullshit. It'll warn mm -mm. you that you're about to have some bullshit, and if you keep it up, it's gonna, it's going to resolve all of it for you. <laughs> and that's that's something that I don't think people completely understand is part of the job when you sit there and you give psychic readings or you know tarot card readings or whatever it is. It's un like you can't really sugarcoat it. When you try to sugarcoat it, you're not normally you know. Some people do feel like you can, and some people feel like you know that you shouldn't. Maybe not be cruel, but be blunt. Some people feel like you shouldn't do that. How do you feel about that? Like, do you, I mean, sort of based on the way that you said, I'm going to, I'm going to take it from the standpoint of you feel like you should be honest and blunt, but mm -hmm. you know, how do you feel about that? Well, you're talking to someone who's uh, done the cancer dance three times, two divorces, the death of uh, all three of my parents, two bios and a stepmother I adored. Is that all bad luck? Is that all bad karma? No, it's what happens in life. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of how do you deal with it? What do you take from it? And in my case, as a natural teacher, what can I learn from it? And then pass it on to somebody else. So um, the other thing that I have to remind people is even the best of us psychically are only 85% accurate. The only one 100% accurate is God, and he's not showing up at psychic fairs or doing phone readings these days. <laughs> so when I show somebody there's a problem, I don't go, oh, my God, you have a family cover. Somebody in your family, I don't no, we don't do that. It's we have a situation here, and let's take a look at how to look at it. For instance, 95% of the questions that I get, does Bruce love me? Yes. Oh, my so, Lord. But then, I, so I pull out five cards. Amanda, Bruce, the relationship as it stands, what she needs to know and best possible outcome at this point. Mm -hmm. And I just read those cards and I make it clear. And then if she goes, I don't know, I pull out my three threes. The first three are status quo. She just bumbles through the relationship and doesn't do anything. Next three, that's your come to Jesus meeting. And y'all do counseling or you draw a line in the sand. You say, we really need change. The third set is hostile. Bye-bye. I'll send you a postcard. I'm so done. Now, one of those might have the big neon sign like in Beetlejuice, you know, over mm -hmm. here. But I have to keep my lip zipped. I can't tell them what to do because that takes away from their free will. So mm -hmm. I may see, yeah, you really need to leave. But if she goes, I guess we'll just keep trying. Fine. Live and be well, baby. You know, that's it. The only time I might change that is if she says that she is being physically abused. Mm -hmm. She is afraid for her life. Then, of mm -hmm. course, you know, I'm also a reverend. The reverend collar goes on. We talk about how to get out of that situation. But everything else, no. I will show you what your options are, but you must take the grown-up responsibility to fix it. As I explain, we can give you the toolbox, but we are not your repairman. That's your job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can't, and the other thing too is, is that people sometimes don't seem to realize is everything that we do and the path that we're on, we're right there and we're always on the path that we're supposed to be on at the correct time. Mm -hmm. However, just like with tarot and with readings and with psychics and with anything else that you do, you know, we can only give you so much you have to take the action. And yes, you may have, you know, 
past issues that are contributing to your decisions and, and things like that. But there comes a period of time where you need to look yourself in the mirror and say, okay, if you went to a psychic or you got a tarot card reading or you did whatever it is that you needed to do, or you just sat down and you were talking with your friends about a decision, you already know what the decision is. You're just afraid to make the step. Mm -hmm. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine. And if you want to keep kidding yourself about it, that's fine. But it's not like you can't blame anybody else but yourself at that point. You're the one holding yourself back from your own success and you're going to have to learn on your own terms. That's exactly right. Um, sometimes it, it's the work that I did with Robert Schwartz in his book series, Your Soul's Planning, Your Soul's Gift. I was one of his channels. I was his past life specialist. I was the one that mm -hmm. could connect you with your own soul to speak to. What we looked at is karma is not carrot and stick. Karma is five things. Unbalanced energy, healing, service, contrast, you want to learn about abundance, you have to be rich one like poor the other. And healing of beliefs. So it's not a matter of you were bad, so you're going through this. When mm -hmm. you give up that idea and you say, all right, I chose this lesson, now what? Mm -hmm. Then you're ready to move forward. Um, I'm actually teaching a course uh, this coming week. It's called Life as Kintsukuroi. Kintsukuroi is the Japanese idea uh, of beauty through breakage, i.e. if you drop a vase, yes, you glue it back together again, but then you paint over the cracks with gold or silver. The idea being it's more beautiful for the breakage. When you realize all the stuff you've gone through, you can either wear it as a pity party and be a victim, or you can be an explorer, an emotional alchemist. How can I see this? Why did it happen? What do I do with it now? How can I change the narrative? Because I don't tell people I fought cancer. What you fight fights back. I don't tell them I'm a survivor because you get the idea of hanging on by teeth and toenails. I say that I was a cancer dancer. I found out how graceful I could be under pressure. I avoided getting my toes stepped on and I got off the dance floor in one piece. <laughs> Two people have breast cancer. Two people have double mastectomies. One of them says it ruined her life. The other one teaches with it. It's not the cancer that was bad or good. It is how you react makes all the difference. It goes, and it's the same thing when you come to me for an intuitive session. I can give you this information. If you just say, it's not fair, God doesn't love me, the universe isn't fair, and you sit in and have your pity party, can't help you. I can give the exact same information to somebody else who says, great, Corby, what do I do with it now? How can I work with it? And that's the difference between... How often, you know how people say, how often should you come to your psychic for a reading? It depends on what you do with the information. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I, and you said that beautifully. And the thing, too, is, you know, I have a, a spiritual guidance service on my website. And mm -hmm. I've had quite a couple people come to it. And I remember in one of the episodes, I said, I know when they're done. I know when they don't need this anymore and they're done. And I know mm -hmm. the ones that still need it. And also from the person giving the guidance from their perspective, you do have to learn, or maybe that's not the right way to say it. Over time, you'll figure out that whatever is said during those times, whether they take your advice or not, has absolutely nothing to do with you. I think sometimes it's very easy to sit there and go, okay, well, maybe I should have given them more advice, or maybe I should have done this or that or the other. And if you're in that place, then you need to figure out a way to strengthen your own confidence and your own confidence in your abilities too and knowing that you're guided and you're doing the right work. I think sometimes people kind of sit down. I Even myself, you know, I have more items now that I've put up on the shop and I, I always wanted to do it, but I was scared because I was like, okay, well, who am I to say that I can do this in a, in a, in a way? Like, okay, yes, you know, I feel comfortable giving guidance. Yes, okay, I feel comfortable doing this. Whether you take my advice or not, that's up to you. And, you know, what you do with that, that's up to you. And I can understand that. But now I'm opening up all these other new doors and I'm going out into all these new experiences that are brand new for me. And how does that feel? And I think that before you should ever offer like your services, you know, for lack of a better word, you need to understand that, there is a beginning and an end to the entire process. And this actually goes into one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Mm -hmm. One of the best things that I learned for myself is that when I'm doing this work, 
I am connecting myself, the whole, you know, sever the cord type thing. I'm mm -hmm. connecting myself for a brief moment in time to use my abilities and whatever guidance I receive and whatever guidance I can give to give to you in order to help you along your journey. What you do with that information from what you don't, again, up to you. And it has absolutely nothing to do with me. Whether I feel, you know, that I should be doing it or I should not be doing it, that comes back, that's reflected particularly on me. But what you say to me during that time and whether you take that advice should have nothing to do with that. Those are two completely different things and you have to understand where you start and end, where the person starts and end in that cord. And that also, it's very important that when you're done with that reading, you cut that cord. Because if you're also an empath, if you also feel other people's emotions, if you keep that cord together and that person's going along their day and they have a shitty ass day, you may be feeling that you have a shitty ass day too and you can't figure out where it's coming from because you never cut your cord. So you have to understand like where the relationship begins and where the relationship ends during the session and the reading. And that there is a difference between business advice and what you're doing as a business and personal and how you treat that person personally. What you're talking about is leaving your ego at the door. Mm -hmm. It's what you're saying is absolutely correct. I look, when I was doing shows in Canada, uh, twice a year, I do a four day show three to nine, 10 to nine, 10 to nine and 10 to six. I would read between 60 and 70 people in four days and do two lectures. If I had not learned how to do what I call system dump, Mm -hmm. There's no way I could have done that. When you sit down with me, I am absolutely pinpoint focused on you. But the minute you get up, I have trained my brain to dump what we talked about, take your mm -hmm. brains, etch a sketch and clear it. So I'm there for the next person. Mm -hmm. So people also need to understand when they call the, you know, you or me up four days later and say, um, remember when you said X, would you like, tell me more about that? I'm sorry, honey. It's like, you done, you gone. You know, I've already yeah. returned the deposit bottle. <laughs> and the thing is, when we're afraid, are we good enough to do it? That is our ego. Mm -hmm. And when we realize we're here in service, it's like, I never learned how to do hands-on healing. I never learned how to talk to dead people. And all of a sudden, one day I could do it. Mm -hmm. And that was the universe saying, hello, here's your draft notice. You're working for me. Yeah. And... When we're out of our way like that, we don't question what we say. Um, simple example. In Kitchener, I was up there three times a year. There was one Labor Day I read for a woman. And, you know, I sensed some challenges coming down the pike. And I told her what they were. And she gets up from my desk and she says, you suck. And she walks away. Well, okay, you know, have a nice life. <laughs> Who is the right one? First one in my seat in January when I come back. <laughs> goes, last time I said you sucked. I said, yes, I remember. Yeah, because you told me that you saw me um, taken in a border and then I was going to want to sell my house. And then I thought that was all bull. But then my uh, daughter moved home because she was pregnant. Now I'm going to sell my house because I want to raise my grandson right. And I still don't like you, but I want to see what else you see. <laughs> don't shoot the messenger. Jeez Louise. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And if there had been ego and I saw how upset she would have been, I would have what I call fumfed. Well, maybe it isn't this, maybe it isn't that. It's just like cold reading when people say, oh, I see a woman next to you. Uh, I think it's your mother. It's your mother. Your mother's not dead. Your grandma, oh, it's your aunt. Oh, please. Oh, please. No, that's called cold reading and that's fishing. I don't fish. Okay. You've got to know that if spirit shows you a plaid rutabaga on a fire engine, they need to know that for a certain reason. And you tell them, mm -hmm. and you also accept the fact that maybe you got it wrong, mm -hmm. but that's because you're human. You're, you're not perfect. And our clients need to understand that too. Yep. I mean, you can only do what you can do. And that's, I mean, that's the, that's honestly the important thing. Mm -hmm. I know, um, recently somebody asked me, well, what exactly is a tarot card reading? And I went into that and I explained, and I looked at them before I even said anything. I just looked at them and I was like, okay, you're definitely like interested in these things. But if I phrase these in certain ways that like the way that I would phrase it, you know, if you just ask me out of the blue and, and I'm not getting like any sort of energetic information from you at all, then I'm just going to phrase it the way that it works for me. And if I do that for you, you're not going to understand it. And so I phrased it for her and she just looked at me and she goes, interesting. 
because I never would have looked at it that way. Her next question to me was, and I'll, I'll also ask your opinion on this. She said to me, so how do you know if the tarot card reading is right? And I said, depending on how it applies to your life. I said, in my personal opinion, at any given time, probably 60% of the cards might allude to something that's currently going on in your life or will be going on in your life at any given time. You'll know if you have a really good tarot card reader, if when you're sitting at that table and you ask that question, they start hitting on certain points and they're not sitting here going, is this correct? Is that correct? Is the other correct? Is so on and so forth correct? They're just giving you the facts, giving you the information. Based on your reaction, they'll know if they're right or not. That's correct. I do say to people after I've said a certain thing, do you understand? Mm -hmm. Understand mm -hmm. is not, is it correct? Because yes. sometimes... Uh, they won't understand an example that you use and you need mm -hmm. to clarify that. But the other thing is, are they vague or not? Mm -hmm. Someone asks me, um, you know, I'm starting a new business. Is it going to be successful? Well, the first thing I do is I look at them and say, and what if I said, no, you're going to leave, you know, lose everything and live in a box under a bridge. Wrong mm -hmm. question. You ask, how do I make it rock? How do I make it sing? Because uh, when I was became a certified professional tarot reader, one of the things that was on the test is how can you rephrase questions for your clients so they get the information that they really want mm -hmm. and may, maybe don't know how to ask about. So in a case like that, I do not flip three cards and say, well, wait, open in July and fire the second redhead. What the hell? <laughs> it's a card for them, a card for the energy around the business, a card for the brick and mortar location, how to market it, clients, competition, staff, finances, what they need to know and best possible outcome. Now that gives them so much juicy information. A, they get excited. B, they see where the challenges might be and they head them off at the pass. And C, they take that and run with it. So that's the other thing is a really good reader will understand how to give you a full picture. It doesn't mean that they tell you, uh, yes, that you have to eat peas on Tuesday. You know, th that's not what we do, but they're going to give you the tools. Now, why do I know about the business thing? I used to be an executive recruiter for engineering and manufacturing. Where in the Tudlika, as my grandmother had said, does it mean you can't use your left brain experience to help your clients as you do a right brain reading? You can't. You, there's mm -hmm. no reason that you can't do that. So one of the things that I'm going to tell everybody out there who is listening, who says, gee, maybe someday I'd like to do this, find your strengths. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, what's your specialty, Melissa? What do you love to do? What, what service do you love to do more than anything else? As far as when it comes to something more spiritual or in general? In this, what's it? All right. How many arrows are in your quiver? For me, it's tarot, it's past lives, it's numerology, it's dead people. So of all your arrows in your quiver, which one's your favorite? Oh, I would have to say it's a mix between tarot and meditation. There you go. Now, you're good at meditation. Me, I'm still a six-year-old in my brain. I race around. <laughs> so I would not teach meditation. Mm -hmm. There are some people who are really good people with pendulums. I have a very slight mm -hmm. benign tremor in my hand, you know, a little bit like Catherine Hepburn had. Mm -hmm. So I can't trust what I'm getting with a pendulum. But you put me with a deck, you put me with past lives, baby, I rock and roll. So please, everybody out there, if you're thinking, gee, I'd love to do what they do, find your specialty. It doesn't have to be everything. Mm -hmm. This is a matter of to thine own self be true. Because the more you love your tools, the better... A reader, a counselor you're going to be, the more confident you're going to be, and the more your ego will stay out of the way because you're not panicked about, oh my God, am I doing it right? Yep. I agree 110%. Actually, it's very funny that you asked that the way that you did because one of the, I have like a little thing on the side with, you know, just little things to ask you, which I haven't mm -hmm. even really gotten to because <laughs> we're just, I know, I'm just uh, right out of the mouth. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, 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 no. I've, I've, I like it and I appreciate it because the other thing too is, and why I even got into this podcast was I had no one to talk to about the things that had happened to me. And I wanted to give people a place where they could either talk about it or they could hear someone who went through it and feel mm -hmm. like they weren't so alone. Initially, I believed in everything I did. You know, I believed in everything as a kid, and that was initially how I was raised. And mm -hmm. then as I was a teenager, 
everything that I could now do, which had now blown up. Mm -hmm. I was just called crazy constantly over that. And that was really, really hard for me. Nothing of what I was doing was crazy or nuts or anything. It was just different. And until it was that I gave them an experience that they were like, oh my God, there's no way you could have known that. There's no way that, you know, you could have done anything. That Mm -hmm. was when they said, oh, wow, okay, you're not crazy. One of the biggest things that I sat down and and I had to say to myself is when my guides sit here and they tell me, "Um, hey, you know what? You're going to be doing this thing. Let's, let's say it's, let's say it's healing. You're going to be doing healing. And I'm like, no, the fuck I'm not. (laughs) Like, you got the wrong person. Like, Mm -hmm. okay, great. So yeah, I've maybe done it a couple of times, but I don't see how you're thinking like this is going, like, I'm not, I don't have a certificate. I don't have, I've never gone to a school. I don't know all the terminology. I don't know all the things that I think is commonly thought you have to know to get into your speciality. Mm -hmm. And they were like, no, 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 you're fine. You can do it. And I was just like, okay, you know what? you know best. I know that you know best. I will just check myself at the door and I will just do what what it is that you're looking for me to do. And that has got me to the place that I am today. And I think that if everybody could do a little bit more of that and just believe, not even just, you know, if you can't believe in the universe or to whatever deity it is that you pray to or your faith or your religion or whatever, just understand that you're a human being with some sort of purpose or some, some sort of goal in your life and understand that that is a goal that only you have and you can achieve and it's in you and it's a part of you and just believe in that believe in yourself just a tiny little bit more and you could get there but you also have to accept that not everybody will believe that this is true to let him anyway i mean my brother he is world famous a physician he's been working in cystic fibrosis and asthma for 45 years okay uh, for a long time, I hid what I did from him because he doesn't mm-hmm. believe in this. And I finally told him and he looked at me and he said, well, shrimp, because that was my nickname as a kid. I'm younger. Mm-hmm. I guess if it's not illegal to this day, he can't admit to anyone that his sister is a psychic. He says I'm, an, I'm a motivational speaker. Um, I've stopped trying to get him to understand it. Mm-hmm. I don't discuss business with him because it's he's not comfortable and mm-hmm. it is egotistical for us to force our reality Mm -hmm. on somebody else and so if you can accept the fact that it doesn't mean you're wrong or bad but just some people are not going to see where you're where you're plugged then again you're going to be able to keep your ego out of it and you're going to keep the connection clean and clear because you're not looking over your shoulder worrying that's very true it's very true Mm -hmm. now you actually since you brought this up a little bit I know that you deal with with tarot cards. What else is it that you typically like to use? What else kind of calls to you? Well, I also have um, seven or eight different oracle decks that I use. Okay. What's the difference? Tarot is your 78 cards of wisdom. They have a very certain structure and a number of cards, and people expect them to look and behave a certain way. I love oracle cards because there are no rules. Mm-hmm. So I have an angel deck for people who love angels. I have Brian Froud's Fairies Oracle, which is not your Ootsie Cutesy Fairies. These guys are uh, Celtic. They march inside your head, rip up the floor tiles, and give you homework. I have mm-hmm. an Energy Oracle deck that is very good for explaining the day-to-day life for somebody. I love the pictures. People understand when they see something and then they hear it, they can understand it better. Yes, of course, I love doing past lives. Why? Number one, I was a theater major, so I can bring it to life. I'm a natural storyteller, and I have adored history since I was a child. Um, My husband and I met at a place called the Old Rhinebeck Aerodrome in Rhinebeck, New York, which has planes from 1909 Blarios to Barnstormers. Because I had a past life in World War I that I remembered very clearly, I knew all that stuff, and as he likes to say, there was this gorgeous brunette who knew the difference between a folk or DR1 and an F1 based on the wing skids, and I had to marry her. Um, <laughs> so when someone comes to me with a past life question, I'm able to say, mm, okay, that's a hobble skirt, picture hat, that kind of an ostrich feather. We're talking 1911 or 1912. Which one is going to give them the closure, the most information, the real understanding of who they were before they're who they are? 
So that's what I love. Dead people. Well, I can do dead people. I'm pretty good at dead people, but it's not a passion. And I will not do it in public because I won't censor. Mm -hmm. So, and this is not a story that I generally going to like share in a, a public setting, but you and I are talking very frankly. When I do mediumship, I get their dog tags. Full name, who they were, the year they died, and how old they were. Example, Jerome Richard Dorkin, my dad, who died in 2001 at the age of 80. Notice that tells me absolutely nothing, but immediately gets me into the energy. And I will tell you everything that I'm getting, whether it's how they died, what they said to you, um, their emotional uh, whatever. And I'm pickier than you. Until you go, ah, that's absolutely them. I won't open the door and then you can actually have a conversation with them. I go away. I let them talk through me. Mm -hmm. But the reason I won't do it in public is because very often there will be something very intensely private that shouldn't go out to most people. Mm -hmm. Years ago, there was a biracial same gender couple. The black partner had died. Her white widow wanted to speak to her. Now, mind you, if you see me, I'm this nice kid who grew up in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, you know, nice Jewish family. I'm married. What comes rolling out of my mouth in flawless urban ebonics was, well, shit, if it ain't my white bitch. And I'm going, oh, my God. <laughs> and the woman in front of me is just laughing and crying and, you know, clapping her chest because that's how her partner walked into the house after every business trip. Now, you can't do that in public. No. You can't. <laughs> not with this face. So... You know, when I do my, my, you know, once a month I do a lightning round free readings on Facebook. I tell people I'm not doing dead people. I don't do health and I don't do dead people because that is not something that should go out in public. You get me one-on-one -on -one and then I will. But that's the other thing is we have to think for our clients sometimes too. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is if the client keeps coming back and wanting to talk to their dead people over and over and over again, you got to be like a good bartender and cut them off because the dead person doesn't need that. They mm -hmm. do. And the live person needs to walk on. Mm -hmm. So my take on mediumship and that's everything that I do. And that's what I love coming back to what you originally asked. <laughs> well, actually, you know that when you said that, it reminds me of this spirit that I had that just sort of, I was scrolling through Twitter and I'm not entirely sure why, but there were a ton of people who had passed away or people talking about how um, their loved one had passed or things like this and, mm -hmm. and that. And I was like, first off, how did this end up on my feed? This is not what I normally look at. And so I was kind of trying to scroll so that I could get through it to get to, you know, something else. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I see this woman does not tell me her name. I know what she looks like, but she won't tell me her name. Won't tell me anything else. And she just kind of like stops, looks at me, turns around, goes away. And then I see her fire, her family. And I could, I knew what she was feeling, but she wouldn't, she didn't give me anything else. And I was like, first off, why? Like, I don't know. Give me something so that I can contact your family and figure out which person it was. And I spent the longest time trying to figure out who it was. And I was so mad at the spirit because I was just like, why? Like you could have given me something. And then I realized prior to this whole you know, going through it and everything. I had been thinking to myself about the fact that, oh, you know, it's been sort of like a little bit of a while and I was still kind of, you know, I thought that when I sort of cut myself off from all of my abilities and I, and then I opened myself back up, I thought I was going to be at square one again. I didn't mm -hmm. realize it was kind of just like I hit pause and then I resumed. I didn't realize that's what was going to happen. And so I was kind of just thinking about that and going through that and thinking about, you know, the last time that I'd even seen a spirit or a ghost or anything like that when this woman popped up. And I scrolled back up and I realized that one of the people in this long list of, of those who were talking about someone who passed, they did not say anything about somebody who passed. But the picture of the family that she'd given me, that she was leaving behind, looked very similar to this person. And mm. I didn't say anything to them. And I felt like that was the right thing to do because she never said anything to me. I felt like it was more like, you were sitting here and you were asking for this. You were asking, essentially, okay, well, you know, I haven't seen a ghost in a while. I wonder if that's still 
something that I can do? Or, you know, do I go back to square one with that? I was kind of going through all those things when then I got sidetracked with the fact that there seemed to be an endless amount of death, you know, tweets on my, on my Twitter feed for no reason. And I was like, okay, thank you. And I, and I, it took me a while. I even said out on the podcast how annoyed I was about this, about this experience that happened and that I thought I was supposed to tell someone this message. And then I realized she never gave me a message. She just gave me that she was here and I could see her. And then she went away. And I was like, oh, that was the message. And it was for me that I didn't lose anything. Nothing went anywhere. Nothing stopped happening. It's just, honestly, I hadn't had a spirit come by in a little bit, which was fine. And then after that, they kept coming by nonstop. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, got, I got that. But sometimes, too, it's like, that's part of it, too, is understanding where does the message come from and and why does it come? And sometimes it is, even if it's very strange, like, I don't know the woman, um, which yes. is why I just assumed it had to be for this family. And that's also another thing. Assumptions really don't work when you're dealing with spirits. Mm -hmm. You know, you touch on something that that'll segue into something that I call drive by psychic shootings. Mm -hmm. um, everybody sees Teresa Caputo, the Long Island medium, go sashaying up to somebody in the frozen pizzas and say, I have a message from your Aunt Doris. Your back tire is bald and you're going to die in a week if you don't get it fixed. Just telling you when she walks away. What the? <laughs> I'm sorry. Number one, who the hell are you? <laughs> Number two, you're invading my space. I didn't give you permission to give me a message. You didn't mm -hmm. ask the classic, may I give you a message? You mm -hmm. just felt that your your ego and ability trumped my safety factor. Mm -hmm. Screw you and the horse you rode in on. Please don't. Do, I call that a drive-by psychic shooting because it just, the person didn't ask for the message. How do you know she doesn't know whether she should trust you? Mm -hmm. She doesn't know anything. And to be perfectly honest, the way that really happens is... Uh, the reality show team goes out and watches a grocery store for a couple of weeks. They approach two or three people. They get them to sign releases. And then there's the setup. So don't believe it when you see that either. Mm -hmm. um, there are very often times when we feel as intuitives, we have a message we have to get to somebody. Mm -hmm. But you don't just give it to them unless they accept it. You walk up and you can say, uh, hi, I've my name is Madam Hoo-Ha, and I believe I have a message for you. May I give it to you? And if they say no, you back off. Yes. It's the same thing with, you know, if I uh, see someone who obviously has a migraine, I can walk up to them and say, you know, sometimes I can relieve, you know, uh, relieve pain. Would you like me mm -hmm. to try for you? If they say no, even if they're right there on the ground, that's it. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, this is one of my personal pet peeves. I have had people see that I've had a headache. Here, let me fix it. And I say, no, thank you, because I'm very sensitive and I'm very picky about who I let do hands on healing. But they say, no, no, it's all right. And they literally come at me with their hands raised. And oh, I have God, to back yeah. up and say, get the out of my face. And they go, oh, so that's not very love and light. You're very mean and say, you're not sensitive. <laughs> I could no. <laughs> You are not respecting my boundaries. I yep. said no, and I mean no. And so that's why some people think, oh, Corby is such a bitch. No, Corby knows her boundaries. And if I trust you and I need your help, I'll say thank you so much. And you will hear the reverberation of my shields go down. Boom. Mm -hmm. But no, when people heal, they're putting some of themselves into you as well. That is very so true. Think about that. So... Respect boundaries, guys. Trust me, the universe will get them the people that they need. Mm hmm Yeah. That's absolutely, that is absolutely so correct. It's so correct. And it's, that is, oh, Lord. Oh, that's, that'll make me go hey, into a tangent. You know, I've been doing gonna... this for 40 years, honey. The, the old fart has so many stories. <laughs> well, and that's the thing, too, is, is that I think, and this actually goes into a question that I was going to ask you, which you, you partially already have answered, but I was going to ask you, what do you feel are the common misconceptions people have about being a psychic in or psychic re readings? And one of the things that I think, if I have to be honest, is one of the biggest ones is like people look at you and they look at you like you're like almost like you're not even a human being anymore. Mm -hmm. They look at you like either one, 
you can do all these amazing things. You must wear a cape and spandex. Or a turban. Yes, this Don't is this is true as well. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your turban and your crystal ball? Um, one of my favorite things now is that on all of my little um, messaging names uh, at work, I put a crystal ball and watching people ask me, what does the crystal ball mean? Oh, that makes my day. Um, yeah. So, or they look at you, they think you're nuts. It's like you, it's like... It's like almost being able, and, and all it really is, is is being able to make enough room in yourself to say that I'm not just myself, I can also talk with the universe and have these connections and these conversations and that I'm willing to understand and grow in these ways. And if need be, or if guided to, or if somebody agrees, help them. That's all it really is. There's, you're still a human being. The last time I checked, I don't have wings growing out of my back, even no. though sometimes I do spiritually have some random wings around me, which is nice. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean that they're mine and that I smack people with them when I walk by. I, I'm just a normal human person. And just the same way that if you're a firefighter, you know, you have so many amazing, incredible experiences and stories to share. It's the same thing if you're a psychic. Like, it's it's the same thing. You, We all have our stories and our experiences, and we should be able to share them. The thing that people need to remember is they could do what we do. Mm -hmm. Everyone has the same wiring. Mm -hmm. um, and the important part is, so for them to not believe that we have all their answers or that they can force the answer from us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's... One of my favorite things is at, at psychic fairs, you know, the, the ones who walk up to you and say, well, tell me something you couldn't know about me. If you're right, I'll have a reading. And I just smile at them and say, I'm sorry, I don't roll over and fetch either. And I turn <laughs> my back and they don't get a reading. Um, or there are the ones that they know that you could make it really happen for them if they do, if they word it right. So remember, we're going back to the Bruce. This is conversations. You and I both had them. Does Bruce think about me? No. Has he ever thought about me? Not the way you want. If I do such and such, will he think <laughs> about me? No. Is he going to call soon? He isn't. Well, if he's not going to call soon, will he call later? And they beat on you until you finally knuckle under and say, yes, he loves you and wants seven babies with you, but he just doesn't know it yet. Oh, good. Please. <laughs> or, you know, they come to you expecting you to do remote spying for them. Oh, yeah. Can you tell me where my ex-husband is sleeping with his mistress? No, I don't do remote spying. Well, is he with the same one or a different one? I said I don't do remote spying. How many prostitutes has he cheated on me that I don't do remote spying? Oh, well, is he sick? Is he going to die soon? Can I still get his money? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> These are things that have really happened. Swear to God, Melissa. I believe you, but it's so funny. <laughs> Jeez, Louise. Um, you know, oh it just God. <laughs> to explain what remote spying is in my book to people out there. Okay. Let's, let's take the old Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Oh, this when is they were together, good. Brad could ask about Angelina. Angelina could ask about Brad. Now they're split up. Brad can't ask who Angie is seeing and Angie can't ask is Brad drinking because they're not together anymore. So, mm -hmm. That would be remote spying. If your life is no longer connected to somebody else's, you can say, well, I just want to make sure they're, they're all right. Well, wish them well from a distance. You don't get to know what's going on with them. The only rule that I change on that is mothers may spy on their children any way they like. But remember, if your mom comes to me, it's the same deal. So, because moms need to know what their kids are doing. If, if they have a 12-year-old and they're not sure, she's not talking to me, and I'm worried, if I will see whether the kid's running around with a gang or smoking, yeah, and I will tell the mother. To me, that's not outing them. That is making sure the kid is safe. Mm -hmm. I know how you feel about that, but that's my rule. So I, I'm always very cautious with... Facebook has an, um, you know, I gotta be honest, I hate Facebook. I hate Facebook. I've never liked the damn thing ever. <laughs> I hate okay. it. It's great for marketing and it's a great way to reach people, that I will mm -hmm. say. But I had joined one of those photo, psychic photo reading things. And it mm -hmm. was because I was like, okay, well, you know, I haven't, again, I had shut off my abilities for approximately, 
Jesus, 10 years or so. So I was like, all right, I haven't done this in a while. This is a really good thing also for me to practice and see if it's something that I feel comfortable with. Let me go ahead and try. I remember the first one I did, um, I did not read any of the comments. The lady put her picture up and I touched on a death that she had in her family recently. And I said who it was and what the relation was to her and things that she was going through and everything. And then I went down, and I read the rest of the comments and all the rest of them were really pleasant. I was like, oh, snap. And she responded back to me privately and said, you know, yes, I was correct. And thank you and blah, 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 and all that stuff. And I was like, okay, cool. The next one was someone posted a volcano. And what they wanted people to try to do was try to go to the location psychically and just see what they got. Now, I did this. I was like, there's definitely something there. Like, I can feel it when I look at the picture. Mm. I wonder what's going on. So I went to a volcano. And I met an elemental. And the elemental was pissed to shit. And it was pissed because, just like I had, plenty of other people had gone there. But it felt that it was the guardian of said volcano. And that by everybody going there, they were violating what its essential rules were, what its boundaries were. And its boundaries, its biggest one was respect. So mm -hmm. people were coming back and saying, oh yeah, I saw this like energetic dragon or energetic thing like this or energetic the other. And I saw the thing and I was, I had a very, very short conversation with it because it was pissed. And I was like, yeah, you're seeing all these things because this is what's what's causing it. The fact that you had you asked people to go to this place and that we all thought, you know, thought it was a great idea because you could feel the energy coming, radiating out of the picture. But this thing was mad. Like it threatened me, much less everybody else. And I actually wrote in the comments, I was like, please do not go there if you do not feel comfortable or you do not know how to put up your own shields. And I explained mm -hmm. what was there and I explained why it was upset and I explained the other forms that it had taken and I sat down and after that experience, I had to really ask myself, how I, how did I feel about psychic photo reading and, and things like that? And I said, you know, it's, it's great. It doesn't really bother me. It does take a little bit of energy because you are truly trying to connect with someone at any, in any place that they are, in any headspace that they're, they're in. Mm -hmm. So try to give them the answer that they're looking for. You also don't know how long ago this picture was taken, which is one of the things I particularly hate about it. Mm -hmm. Um, or if it's really even them if you don't really know what you're doing and or if they're very good at masking that information from you you may not you know you may go to this person and then be like wait a second there's a disconnect here what's the disconnect and then you find out it's somebody else mm -hmm. so i feel like that's one of the things you have to be very very careful of i have never i have never done it for like a mother to a child or something like that mm -hmm. but i can see like as a parent you have to know my other thing that i would say though is if you are this concerned and I guess maybe, you know, maybe it's me like putting, maybe I'm putting a little bit too much in the hands of the other person. I don't know. But my, my in my opinion, just like the story that you shared about the the person who uh, was talking about, is my husband going to see this mistress as the same one? Yeah. You already know. So what the fuck do you need mm -hmm. me for? You already know. You already know the fact that this is happening. When you're a parent, that's different because it's your kid and you want to take care of them and, and protect them. And perhaps there is something that needs to be looked at there from a spiritual standpoint. To me, it's a two-way street. If you want to bring yourself to somebody, that other person also has to want to bring themselves to you. If you're just sitting there and banging against the wall and forcing yourself on that person, then you're not, you're not being helpful. You're doing more harm than good. I agree with that. Just, just for we, I pulled three cards. I gave myself a person. And so how would I read cards? A mother is concerned about her 16 year old daughter. Mm -hmm. We've got 10 of swords, princess of swords and the fool. Now the 10 of swords to me, that's, there's no more blood to bleed. And I would just tell the mother, there's a situation your kid is going to have to walk away from. Could be a friend, could be a failure, but she can't fix it. The Princess of Swords card, uh, I always call that the card of the smart assitude. Why don't you mm -hmm. fight? I'll sell tickets. If she gets snarky, realize she's not really being snarky at you. She's blowing mm -hmm. stuff off. So if that happens, you can say to her, what's going on? I think you're hurting about something. And she might tell you. The following card, it's the Fool card. And I remind people, the Fool card is not the idiot. It's the exuberant rookie. And you look at the allegory in the card, the rose, the hobo bag, and the daughter. 
If you grab hold of what you're passionate about, carry very little old baggage, and only tell those who are loyal where you're going, you can cross mountains and fly. What this basically would tell me is the kid will heal from this situation. Mm -hmm. It's something that needs to be shaken loose out of their life. And the only thing you need to do, Mom, is be that loving rock that she can hold on to while she adjusts. You don't mm -hmm. have to do anything. And that's an example of how I would read for a parent. Not, yes, go in her third drawer and you're going to find the marijuana and the contraceptives. No, mm -hmm. that's that's remote spying and I don't yeah. do that. Yeah, that makes sense. I think we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. I agree. Now, we have talked a lot about psychic and medium and readings and things like that. Talk to me about your book. What made you want to, to do these books? What called you to that? All right. Um, number one, I've always loved words. Words are my drug of choice. And my fabulous beloved father who was my best friend always said you have to write you just something every day and what do you do you write what you know so the four things in clean out your life closet clarity adaptability simplicity and making friends with stress are the four things that my clients always talk about they really need work on but i do not say do everything i tell you when it all gets better why i haven't lived your life Mm -hmm. So the way that book is structured is in a chapter. I'll tell you what went on in my life. Tell you a little bit about a couple of clients that dealt with it. Then I'll say, you might want to try these things. But at the end of each chapter, there are open-ended questions where you can take what I wrote and see if it works for your life. For instance, one of the chapters is life is a tiny house. The questions are, how do you view stuff? How do you view your stuff in particular? How does your stuff serve you? Notice that's not a yes or no, right or wrong question. That's just so you can explore and look at your own life. By the end of that book, if you've done all those chapters, that's your personal journal. Psychic Yellow Brick Road is because there is nothing out there that is basically psychic boot camp mm -hmm. that teaches people how to stay safe, how to avoid getting lost in psychic world. It's full of practical information. It's what questions can I ask? What questions aren't right? What to watch out for? And then, you know, yeah, a little bit about the angels and guides and how, what to expect with mediumship. And the final chapter, can I do this too? Yes, kids, ground, center, and shield. You must go to boot camp. And, you know, I warn people away from certain things. Like people look at me and say, what do you think of Ouija boards? And they see steam coming out of my ears. Because uh -huh. when you play with a Ouija board and you don't know how to ground, center, and shield, basically it's like throwing open your door in a strange neighborhood and yelling, free beer. You don't know who's out there, but they heard you and they're coming. Yeah. And for every Esther Hicks with Abraham uh, and Jane Roberts with Seth, there are people like the two hysterical teenagers I had to deal with who were terrified because when they put their hands on the planchet with no protection and just said, who's there? What was spelled very fast and backwards was, I have an ax and I'm here to kill you. Trust me, it's not your Uncle Danny. Mm -hmm. And for everybody who says, oh, but it's in the toy department. How difficult can it be? This <laughs> always comes up. I look at my audience and say, all right, who here has a kid or a grandchild under 10? And their hands go up. I said, all right, you, Peter. How old is Peter? Peter's seven. Fine. Peter comes home from school and says, Mommy, 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 I got all A's on my report card. You promised I could have a new toy, and so let's go to the toy department. And he brings you over to a box that says, My first chainsaw. It's in the toy department. Are you going to let him play with it on his own? I don't think so. Get a clue, guys. You know, if you're going to do what we do, and you can, ground, center, and shield, find someone reliable to teach you, Mm -hmm. um, I have a list of books on my website, and one that I recommend is Psychic Protection by Ted Andrews and Opening to Channel by Sanaya Roman and Dwayne Packer. That's the book that taught me how to talk to dead people and do spirit guides. Mm -hmm. But do the work first. Please just don't go out there and assume that, you know, you're like Elton John, you can hit the piano and then everyone's going to cheer. It's not going to be like that. It takes work. Melissa's been doing it since Moses was in diapers, and so have I. That's why we're good. And it's why we're safe. Yeah. And that's, that's the biggest thing. It's just to be safe. I mean, I, I who was it that talked to me about a Ouija board? Somebody talked to me about a Ouija board and why do I hate them so much? And I said, you know, I honestly, truly would feel that if I decided that I wanted to use a Ouija board 
I'd probably be okay. Probably. Probably. And it is only because I can see spirits, I've dealt with the darker side of stuff quite a couple of times, and the lighter things of stuff, and that I feel pretty comfortable, and I know that my home is a nice, safe, positive environment of where nothing bad can enter or stay. Mm -hmm. And same with me. But why do I feel that way? Because I have shielded the fuck out of it. <laughs> yes! Yes. That's why. <laughs> you know, and grounding, centering, and shielding is not just for psychic work. Exactly. You, know, you, you've you gone into bars, and mm -hmm. it ain't great. But if you know how to ground, center, and shield, you'll have that protective bubble around you that will blunt a lot of the emotional stupids, and it'll keep you more alert. So, guys, you know, even if you don't want to do wiki woo the way we do, go learn how to grand center and shield. It's good for you. It's like a vitamin. Take it. It's good for you. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> that should be a slogan. <laughs> ground center, <laughs> ground center, center and shield. It's a vitamin. It's good, it's good for you. It, it's good for you. What could it's it hide? <laughs> that's Brooklyn. What could it hide? Oh, God, that's funny. Oh, that's funny. Okay. Is there anything else that you want to share that we didn't touch on that you want to talk about? Um, just go read the book. Go enjoy the book. I am not the be all and end all. But if there's anything in those books that will help you, then I did my job. Mm -hmm. um, you can find them on, they're both on Kindle on Amazon. Clean Out Your Life Closet is actually also an audio book that I read. If you want the paperback of Psychic Yellow Brick Road, you have to get that through my website, corbymitlight.com. Clean Out Your Life Closet is paperback on Amazon. Don't ask me why they said that, but there you are. <laughs> if This is my full-time job, guys. Uh, I read 1,200 people a year. You are, you are why I'm here. So that's corbymitlight.com. That's Fire Through Spirit on Facebook. And again, uh, we are not the repairman, but we've been through a lot. If there's anything people like me or people like Melissa can help you with to keep your head on straight and make your walk a little easier, that's what we love to do. And that's why we're here. That is absolutely beautiful. Well, Corby, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Oh, I had a great time. You are, you have been a delight. You made me laugh a lot. <laughs> Good. But it's Good. but and it's all it's all laughter because it's the honest and pure truth. And I think that, you know, sometimes we do need to say it in a way that is blunt and understanding so that people also realize that, you know, there's nothing's perfect. Nothing is perfect in this world. Perfect is very overrated, but it can be very, very good for you, and there are ways to make it very good for you, and it can be bad for you if you have got the 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 wrong people. So you know, mm -hmm. just you said it best. If we can help you, we can help you. And I will um, make sure that all of your links for your books and your website and everything will be in the podcast show notes. So people head over to that and check Corby out and buy your books. And we're back. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I know I did. So with that, there's a couple of things that I want to say to you guys. As I said in the beginning of the show, it's really difficult for me right now to see everyone's panic and to keep that at bay and keep it away from myself. And what I really want to say to everyone right now listening, especially because there's so many people who have abilities and can feel other people's emotions and maybe don't know how to turn it off, is you need to, you need to find your isolation. I know that sounds like you're running and hiding, but sometimes you have to sit back and take a step back in order to find an idea that works for you and move forward. For me right now, it's just being quiet. It's just being quiet because then I gain the ability to check in with myself. I've been very in tune with myself, very in tune with my space. I've been spending more time meditating, more time doing yoga. Um, I've been meditating quite often. The spirits even actually are quieter around me, but I have just been taking a lot of quiet time with everything. I have been spending a lot of time talking with the universe. You can call it praying or talking, whatever it is you'd like to, but I spend a lot of time just being grateful to the universe and speaking with it and kind of renewing that energetic connection with the universe and with this planet and the earth and people in my own way that feel safe to me. 
And every time that I step outside, I shield myself. Like Corby said, ground, center, and shield. I had told her initially, when we recorded this episode, I said I would put it out in March. I felt like that was going to be a really great time for it, especially because of a couple other things that were going on. And it turns out I was really right. Her advice for grounding and centering and shielding yourself could not have come at a better time with everything that's going on right now. So please know how to do that. And if you don't, send me a message, email me something, and I will try to assist you as much as I can. And with that, please, again, take care, be safe, have a good night, and a good day. And don't let the hate out there get to you. Bye. Thank you.